Hello, I'm your host, Charlie Wenham. Welcome to another edition of Lost Louisiana, What's in the Name, Part 5. Can you believe it? This is our fifth show on LPB dedicated to finding out the origins of Louisiana towns with unusual names. My photographer, Vernada Woods, and I have traveled to 25 towns over the past several years, from Abita Springs to Zawali. And we ask one simple question, how did that town get its name? It's interesting to see how that one basic inquiry becomes the cornerstone to some wonderful storytelling. We are coming to you from the historic town of Donaldsonville. This Mississippi River community, located between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, was once the capital of Louisiana. And in a little while, I'll tell you how Donaldsonville got its name. But we begin with a town in Acadia Parish named Rain. Rain's claim to fame, well, it revolves around a cold-blooded animal lurking throughout the bayous. This isn't a dangerous creature, but rather quite a tasty one. The moment you're in the city of Rain, Louisiana, it doesn't take long to detect a pattern, a pattern of frogs. From the 13-foot aluminum frog named Monsieur Jacques to over 50 murals to the long-standing tradition of the Rain Frog Festival, this town was built on frogs but it wasn't named for the creature. So what's in a name? And how did Rain, Louisiana get its name? Well, depending on who you ask around here, you could get three different stories. Meet Cheryl McCarty and Tony Olinger. They were born and raised here. The two carry the torch when it comes to town history. They have written two books, including one called Rain, as well as another called Rain's People and Places. The town could have been named after a passing railroad worker named B.W.L. Rain when the Louisiana Western Railroad installed a telegraph switch here. There are no pictures of this mystery man, only a newspaper mentioned in the 1880s. It may be connected to a Robert Rain, a prominent businessman who built the Rain Methodist Church on St. Charles in New Orleans. But Tony and Cheryl think the town is named after a woman named Fanny Rain. She married an area millionaire named John Jennings McComb. McComb made his money by inventing a mechanical cotton baler. It's very intriguing to have three different options or three different versions of it. We believe that the one with John Jennings uh, McComb, whose wife was Fanny Rain, is, is the true version. With some of the historical research that Mr. Milo Doubleval did uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and we believe that is a true version with some of the documentation that we do have. When the railroad came through, the closest town was a mile away named Poopaville. And when the railroad didn't come to the town, the town came to the railroad. This marker, this brown pelican marker, actually is uh, erected where the Poopaville started. Jews Poopaville had a store here along with J.D. Bernard. And uh, this is where it all started, Poopaville. <laughs> We've got this marked right here. They were all moved by oxen cart over to the center of town to Rain Station. Okay. And as a matter of fact, this particular marker right here is uh, the first post, post office that well, was in Jules Poopeville's store. And uh, Joseph D. Bernard was the first postmaster here who eventually became the first mayor of Rain. So we've got all this wonderful stuff memorialized right here where it all started. St. Joseph's Church relocated to Rain as well. And the St. Joseph Cemetery is the only known graveyard with plots laid out in a north-south position. Traditionally, they lay east and west, metaphorically representing life, with the rising and setting of the sun. It is the only known Judeo-Christian cemetery in the world with this characteristic. We're not real sure what happened. There's lots of stories about, you know, grave diggers that may have tilted the bottle a little bit too much when it got started, but we eventually, by the time it was discovered, it was too late and most of the cemeteries had been laid in this way. And now we actually have gained a claim in Ripley's Believe It or Not for being the only known cemetery facing north and south as opposed to east and west. In the late 1800s, Rain, Louisiana was the major exporter of big, juicy Louisiana frog legs. At that time, Jacques Weil and his brothers began using frog capital of the world in their marketing information. The delicacies were shipped to New Orleans restaurants, as well as Sardi's in New York. And actually, it got one time where we had uh, three frog companies in the rain operating, and they would actually send runners out early in the morning, two or three o'clock in the morning, to all the different areas like Chitania and Henderson, and the first one there could buy the frogs out the swamp. And back in the old days, they'd actually cut the frog legs off and sell them, and they would give the, the we call the fronts, the front legs and the front, to all the local people. They would just give them away because they had so many. And that's really the best part, and either the frog is the most tender part. 
What do you make out of them? Make a, a cubillon or a sauce piquant. Either one of those do real well. So starting with Donat Puchot, a Frenchman, and then the Jacques Weil family, they started exporting frogs both to restaurants and to universities for biological research, as a matter of fact. In addition to putting frogs in barrels for nearly 100 years, the city of Rain has also sent frogs into space. So many people don't know that in 1970, we sent two bullfrogs into space as a part of uh, the medical research. So we've actually had frog anots. <laughs> <laughs> the two frogs that were sent up into space were Pierre and Tinome. I have no idea who named them, but those are good Cajun names. We had Cajun frogs in space. The send-off committee included then Congressman Edwin Edwards. Two bullfrogs spent seven days in space on a NASA mission. And uh, the information that was relayed back to um, NASA was very instrumental in determining the effect of anti-gravity and weightlessness on a human's ears, because a frog's ears are very similar to a human's inner ear. These days, this town of roughly 8,500 people has elevated the Louisiana bullfrog to new heights and every storyline imaginable. This mural in front of the city courthouse makes a good case that the folks in rain have a pretty good sense of humor when it comes to being the frog capital of the world. The murals are all around, including Depot Square, the site of the town's first railroad station. The Depot Square is such an integral part of the city of rain, and it's only fitting that we have some of our murals here, right here at the Depot Square. Of course, this one is frogs partying with an accordion. You gotta love that. On the opposite side, when trains pass, they actually see a frog mural that says Bienvenue. There's even a relatively new copper frog fountain sitting in the park. And in time, those copper frogs will turn green. And the annual frog festival has been a long standing, make that jumping tradition, complete with frog races, a beauty pageant, as well as great food and music, all celebrating the life of this Acadian amphibian. No good for me. So for Cheryl and Tony, they take their frogs and their history seriously, but not too seriously. Kermit the Frog is contradicted every day here. Why is that? Because it's easy being green. People have a lot of pride in rain. Uh, you can see, you know, look around here, it's a very clean city. Every year after year, we win clean the city contests. It's just a real warm Louisiana community that a lot of people really love being in. Uh, it's hard for people to leave here. You know, sometimes you know, people do go away, but they always tend to come back. Because of Hurricanes Gustav and Ike, organizers had to reschedule the Frog Festival, which is usually held in the first weekend in September. The 36th annual celebration was held on the second weekend of November to rave reviews. This year's Frog Festival Queen was Chelsea Richard. And if you're interested in buying the books on rain written by Tony and Cheryl, you can find them on Amazon.com. Next we jump from frogs to alligators as we travel the Louisiana coastline to South Lafouche Parish. The town of Cutoff, Louisiana is actually home to the largest alligator farm in the world. But before you think this town is named after some freak mishap at the gator farm, we hooked up with a couple of well-known area residents to help us bite into the real story of Cutoff. Meet Roland Guidry and Wendell Curall, a couple of Cajun guys who love where they live. Along Bayou Lafouche, about 40 miles off the Gulf of Mexico, is a community called Cutoff. It's a place where everybody knows everybody. My family trapped with his family, and so I've been knowing him since before he was born. So I guess we've been trapped. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not paying attention when you're passing through, you will miss the rich, deep, and profound history of the town. Where is it? It's that ditch over there. They often talked about it as being the cutoff canal, a cutoff canal to go from Bayou Lafourche to New Orleans, but that was a, one of the stories that was out there. Roland does the research and says, no, actually it was to help with drainage, basically, not, not, not a flood control. This ditch actually has a great story, and it began during the War of 1812 when General Andrew Jackson's troops cut down a two-mile swath of willow trees into Bayou Lafourche. 
This obstruction prevented the British Navy to make a backdoor route through Donaldsonville and into New Orleans. The obstruction worked, but it left Bayou Lafourche a mess. After the war, boats could not navigate the bayou. Louisiana applied for federal assistance and got it 50 years later. And creating a cutoff canal in 1856 helped area farms from washing away from the annual floods. Well, it was, it was called a cutoff outlet. And there, there are those all over the state, cutoff outlets. But this one, the name stuck. So after the hurricane of 1893, the Chenier a lot of people moved up. And by the time they, they were saying, well, where are you going? We're going by the cutoff. And eventually the people said, we're going to cut off. Cut off was the name used by the English. The French speaking settlers, however, called this area Cut Blanche. Cut off on the map was first. Community called itself Cut Blanche. But that's when the people moved from the hurricane. Yeah. They moved their homes, and everybody moved close to each other, and they painted their homes white. Yeah. And, and most they, fishermen and, did. I mean, at Cypress yeah. House, you don't need to paint. Yeah. But they, so they, they painted they, their homes white, and it was a and so people passing in the, the white say, coast. That's the Côte Blanche. It's it's the Blanche. white coast. This cutoff canal was once 35 feet wide and five feet deep. It was even used during Prohibition to move bootleg whiskey. But now it's just an extra mowing challenge, sitting alongside the beautifully restored home of Kirk St. Pierre. Well, that's okay. Fact is, this canal is part of the rich family histories carved out in cutoff. We live in a place that the marsh around us makes us who we are. I mean, to be able to go, I remember uh, as a kid, uh, you can go and catch craw crawfish and back and feed your family. Now think about it. Where else can a kid just go do something and feed the family? Well, if you like gator meat, perhaps you could go down the road to Savoie's Alligator Farm. It is the largest gator farm in the world. At last count, there were over 115,000 gators being raised. Meet Lance. He's been working here for 19 years, ever since he was 13. And he's only been bitten 40 times. I have got bit in 2002. I had a, um, a female drag me out of an air boot when I was picking up her eggs. Come on. Yep. How'd that work out? Uh, I got away from her and I went to the hospital and I had a couple of little stitches and holes on my side, but it all healed up better. And the next day I was back at work. <laughs> the gator pens are kept at a constant 90 degrees. In this pen, 400 baby gators, including a few albino alligators, are kicking about waiting for feeding time. Instead, Lance looks to add bite number 41 to his resume. These are babies. They were born uh, within a three-week period this past August. And right now they're... Um... <laughs> Right now, they're about a foot long. This alligator right here in the wild, to get to three and a half feet would take approximately seven years. Really? We grow them over here in 12 to 14 months. The gator skins are sold all around the world and will likely become a future pair of boots, watch band, or even a purse. The meat is processed in Lafayette and is also sold across the country. Savoie's Gator Farm also releases 14% of their gators back into the wild. It's not just gators making a return into the waters. Cutoff is also the home to a beautifully restored wooden oyster boat. Well, it was uh, originally built in uh, 1940 by uh, Camille Chermy, and uh, it was built for my great grandfather, uh, Emil Emard, and uh, it was built as an oyster boat. And. Uh, it's pretty much been in the family uh, ever since. The family got out of the oyster business in the 80s, but restored the vessel and now use it strictly for pleasure boating. The only oysters that we have on here is either oysters on the half shell or marinade or oyster soup, and that's it. It was built here and cut off. It, it, it lives here and cut off, and that's where she's going to stay in, in, in cut off. That's true not only for the boats, but most of the people here. They were born in cut off, and that's where they'll stay. I think John Fall said it best. That's the thing about why do we live here? You know, God gave us the best cupboard in the world. When you talk about this productive estuary that, that, that came, it, it's hard to match anywhere in the world. And you talk about the, the upland, 
the, the, and you tie in some few hogs, everything tastes good with pig fat, you know? So you put that with the seafood around us, the estuary that has fresh uh, environment all the way to the salt environment, how can you do better? Roland and Wendo could talk for days about cut off and cut blanche if you let them. And if you're lucky enough to know Mike Bell and his family, you just might get a chance to take a ride along Bayou Lafouche on his family's beautifully restored wooden oyster boat. We are at the halfway point of our journey and we have three more towns to visit. When we come back, photographer Vernada Woods and I head to the beautiful area of Toledo Bend to take a walk back in time in the village of Fisher. Just a stone's throw away in Manny, we'll see how that town was once a neighbor to the largest military base in the country. And of course, we'll tell you how this town, Donaldsonville, got its name as well. You're watching Lost Louisiana, What's in a Name, Part 5 on Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Welcome back to Lost Louisiana, What's in a Name, Part 5. I'm your host, Charlie Winham. We next head to the beautiful Toledo Bend area and the village of Fisher. These days, Fisher is easy to miss as you travel along Highway 171 in Sabine Parish. But if you slow down enough to catch the historic business district, you will not be disappointed. Back in the day, Fisher, Louisiana was a thriving, self-sufficient company town that boasted all the creature comforts of the 19th century. A little over 100 years ago, there was a small yet progressive village of Fisher. This town was built out of the tall Louisiana pines in 1899. That is when the Louisiana Longleaf Lumber Company built a sawmill as well as an entire community complete with a church opera house, a train depot, as well as a company store. A century ago, the village of Fisher was a community where a steam whistle called you to work six days, and a church bell requested your presence once a week. Susan Slay has been the mayor of Fisher since 1992. So mayor, this is the village of Fisher. That is correct, the village of Fisher. How many people live here? Around 300 now. During its peak time, when it was a big lumber bill company town, how big was Fisher? I would say it, probably over a thousand. Mm -hmm. The school probably had 300 in it. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Slay handles her duties out of the former office of the 4L Company. Her town hall is 107 years old. How did Fisher get its name? It came from their owner, Mr. Fisher. His first name was Oliver. The owner of the lumber yard. That's right. He came here to establish the uh, company, which was lumber. In Fisher, if you didn't work here, you didn't live here. Mayor Slay remembers her dad working six days a week as a foreman for the lumber company. I remember coming over and picking up my dad's paycheck, and it was on a Saturday, but they didn't give paychecks, they gave cash. And I would stand in line and uh, wait on a Saturday and uh, get his few dollars, and most of the time it was only five dollars. Where would you pick up that check? Right there at that window. That little window, that off, little to the, window off to the left. Off to the left. You we pick would, up your we daddy's would, paycheck, which was a $5 bill. That's fine. All money was given in cash. By the late 60s, the sawmill closed down. But thanks to Boise Cascade, the current owners, they donated the town's historic buildings and land to the Fisher Historic Foundation. This historic district was entered in the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. One popular spot for tourists is the Old Commissary. Back when Fisher was a company town, this massive store provided residents everything needed, from cradle to grave. These days, it's a haven for antique hunters. 
people who may like to go antiquing, this is a pretty good place. Oh, definitely. That, uh, the old commissary, which is a huge building now, it is loaded with antiques and the depot is also loaded with antiques. As the Old Mill Flea Market gets ready for another season of Christmas shopping, make sure you pay close attention to the signs. Over 30 vendors make up this antique store, and if you thought you could buy anything inside, you'd be heartbroken. This is Sandra Gale Lewings. She fell in love with Elvis Presley after the Louisiana Hayride. I tell you what, I like it all. It's all, I love it all. I love this picture too, uh, the one in the red. I love that one, Elvis and I. Gail proudly shows off her display of Elvis memorabilia. Her collection is a shrine, not a store. So you can't buy a thing. One day there were some girls that came in here, gathered up all of this stuff and took it up to the front. And I was having a stroke. I said, oh no. And everybody said, and they looked at me like, they didn't know what was going on. I said, and they said, what's wrong? I said, oh no, you have to carry all of that back. None of this Elvis stuff is for sale. <laughs> this belongs to me. I've been collecting it since I was. The market is open Thursdays through Sundays and offers plenty of good ideas for Christmas shoppers as well. This town, what's its future? That's a good question. Um, Let's just hope that it will be maintained, that, you know, that there'll be people that really care about Fisher that do not want this heritage to get away. Because I know I'm getting up in age and, you know, it's got to be some young ones that really love it, that want to keep it. This is heritage. This is not something you're going to see in the big cities. In fact, this is the only uh, place that I know of in Louisiana as such. It's like stepping back in time. Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, most company towns were hastily constructed villages of shanties for the workers. The village of Fisher and the Louisiana Longleaf Lumber Company broke that mold. 100 years ago, the 4L Company built the houses the workers lived in and most of those homes are still standing today. And by all means, for a real treat, head to Fisher on the third weekend in May for their annual Sawmill Days. The festival recaptures the flavor of life in a sawmill town, as well as raises funds for the historical district. Next, we head a few miles north to the town of Manny, Louisiana. They could have been the home to the 4L Company, but town leaders back then decided over 100 years ago they did not want all that noise and commotion. That may be easier to understand once you discover Manny, Louisiana once was neighbor to the largest military base in the United States. Beauty and brawn surrounds the town of Manny, Louisiana. It is a quiet community that is just a stone's throw away from the tranquil shores of Toledo Bend and a former military fortress helped shape this area as well. Meet Mayor Ken Freeman. He's been mayor of Manny for 20 years, and he tells me this area was first known as Baldwin Store. A marker commemorates the town's early origins. In 1843, the center of the parish was a place called Baldwin Store, just a large dog track log cabin. And at that time, it was where everyone could gathered. It's where uh, courts were held. The traveling ministers would come there. It was a, a post office. It was a courthouse. It was a jailhouse. It was everything that a governmental building should be, but on a much simpler scale. But as the United States expanded in the early 1800s, this area grew as well. Mayor Freeman remembers coming here as a child and caught a glimmer of Manny's past. Mayor, this is a beautiful church. It almost looks like the Alamo. When I was eight years old, coming down San Antonio Avenue, it's one of the first things that I remember about this community was this old church. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, man, we are going back in the pioneer days. <laughs> I expected people to ride horses and have guns, holsters, and that sort of thing. But <laughs> it's been uh, 
I found out that that was not the case, which was fine. Well, Manny burned the ground in around 1904, and all of the buildings you see along here are original to 1904. We have the old Sabine Theater behind us. The very first two-story brick building in Sabine Parish is right behind us. About 25 years ago, a developer bought this whole block and renovated it into storefronts, and now they're being used by stores, and it retains the original flavor of the original town, which we're very proud of. So, how did Manny get its name? The town was named after Colonel James B. Manny, who was reported to have been a very popular commander at a nearby military fort, protecting the area against Spanish threats from what is now Texas. Six miles east of the town of Manny is this site, the Fort Jessup State Historical Site. Colonel James B. Manny was the commander here, and it was built in 1922. And at the time, this was the largest military base of the United States. In fact, half of the U.S. Army traveled through Fort Jessup en route to the war with Mexico in 1845. Following a United States victory, the fort was no longer needed as a border outpost and was abandoned one year later. Fort Jessup is now a National Historic Landmark, complete with a museum and a modest amount of artifacts. Dana Jeter is the park manager. These are remnants of old officers' quarter buildings, uh, the rock and uh, the limestone. The lime was brought in from the hillside in order to construct the foundation of the buildings. Uh, we had a row of about six to eight officers' quarters um, in this vicinity, and behind each officers' quarters was the kitchen um, that the soldiers had their meals in and socialized. This is the actual oldest building, uh, the, the only building that we have uh, left on site from that particular time period. This is the old kitchen in which all the soldiers would come in and have their meals each day, whether it be um, for breakfast or for the evening dinner. Fort Jessup was saved thanks to the dedication of so many from Manny. On a spring day in 1960, Fort Jessup State Park held a grand reopening. One of those responsible for its restoration was longtime Manny resident and daughter of the American Revolution member, Catherine Vines Davis. Colonel Manny gave it a little bit of culture and class. He had everyone to dress in uniforms early and have a parade at 8.30 in the morning with top hats or cocked hats and so forth and a band, the band played and it was a cultural place. Ms. Davis knows a little something about Southern culture. Her family goes all the way back to the first days of Manny. Catherine is known to speak her mind and she lives in the same house she was born in. Her home is adorned with artwork. It includes one piece from Louisiana artist laureate Amos Lee Armstrong. This is called The Road to Manny, but the most cherished works were painted by her mother Gussie. Gussie painted everyone in the family, Catherine's husband, her sister Betty Lynn, even her grandfather William. And oh yes, Gussie painted Catherine, and it is dazzling. Well, I think this was it. The dress that I had was used at the Alpha Delta Pi sorority at LSU in Baton Rouge. We had uh, uh, parties and uh, little receptions and such as that. Well, I bought the dress in Baton Rouge at, uh, I can't think of the name of the store now, it wasn't Dalton's, uh, Rosen, Rosenfields, I believe was the name of it, and so forth. I bought the dress there, and it was flattering, shall we say, and so she painted it in that dress. And it's a safe bet to say her great-great-grandfather probably knew Colonel Manny. One day, she would like to donate her home to a new chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution and name it the Colonel James B. Manny Chapter. It's all part of the Southern culture that still surrounds her to this very day. These days, how do you spend your days? Watching PBS every night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I watch, watch the television. The young people are very kind to me. They kind of look at me like she's something special. There aren't many people around here that re remember things like that and so forth. Mayor Ken Freeman agrees. 
he thinks the world of Catherine and of Manny. He also keeps one eye to the future and hopes Sabine Parish could be the next big retirement community in the country. We're also trying to develop Manny and Sabine Parish and Toledo Bend as a destination point for retirees. Retirees are looking for a less congested area uh, other than Florida and we are central to the country. Uh, it's beautiful out there. Property prices are reasonable. They have all the amenities of a large town but still enjoy the small town security and and friendliness that they, they would like to look for. It's a good place to raise a family. It's a good, good place to build a life. Manny and Fisher are just two of many quaint and historic spots in the Toledo Bend area that offers visitors so many wonderful options. For more information on these and other towns near Toledo Bend, go online at www.toledo-bend.com. Finally, we will wrap things up right here in the historic town of Donaldsonville. Just like Fort Jessup near Toledo Bend, water plays a significant role in military strategy for a young and growing United States. This Mississippi River town had a Union fort during the Civil War that played a major role in keeping Confederate troops from advancing. Almost everywhere you turn, you can see the history of Donaldsonville and Louisiana if you know who to talk to and where to look. The historic town of Donaldsonville is made up of a mysterious founding father, a forgotten military fort, a history-making mayor, and music. Local historian Kirk Landry helps us sort it all out. So Kirk, what's in the name? How did Donaldsonville get its name? Well, there was this gentleman by the name of William Donaldson who was a visionary, and uh, he was a legislator, a banker, uh, and he, he was a city planner and city builder and he his vision was to build a town that would one day become the capital of the state of Louisiana. Evidence of William Donaldson's work is everywhere but if you're looking for a picture, a statue or even some of the most basic of information on Donaldson, Kirk says you'll have to keep looking. Well, we know William Donaldson, uh, as I said, uh, we, what we don't know is where he was born. We, he, we know he was of English descent. We don't know if he was born uh, here in the States or if he was born uh, across the pond in, in England. Uh, we know he passed away in 1813. We don't know where he's buried. Uh, so there's a lot of work left to do on, uh, on William Donaldson. In 1806, Donaldson commissioned Bartholomew Lafon a successful New Orleans city architect, to draw up the city plan. LaVille de Donaldson was incorporated in March of 1813. William Donaldson died six months later. Even though we don't know much about William, the town of Donaldsonville overflows with history. Donaldsonville is the third oldest city in the state of Louisiana, has the second largest historic district, only after the French Quarter. In fact, many people may not know Donaldsonville was once the state capital. This is what the capital looked like in 1830. But just like the founding father, no trace of the state capital remains. Legislators complained about the building leaking, and Deville did not have the same pizzazz as working in New Orleans. By 1831, lawmakers returned to the Big Easy, and the Donaldsonville capital was demolished. The bricks were dumped in the bayou for added protection from flooding. Thirty-three years later, civil war broke out. Bayou Lafourche connected the Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi River, and Donaldsonville was a contested strategic position. During the Civil War, Union troops built a fort right here and named it Fort Butler. Troops were made up of mostly freed slaves. Now, even though there's very little signs left of this earthen fort, the real story of the Battle of Fort Butler lies just below the surface. Kirk, tell me about this site. Well, what we're standing on is 
a very historic site, probably we're right in the middle of what once what was once Fort Butler, okay. uh, a Union fort here in Donaldsonville, which there was a battle June 28, 1863, where Confederate forces led by General Tom Green attacked the fort. Probably anywhere from 800 to 1,200 Confederate forces led by Green attacked the fort defended by 187 uh, men from the 28th Maine and a, a number of free men of color who successfully defended that fort in one of the Civil War's only nighttime battles. Hundreds of dead Confederate soldiers lay underneath in a mass grave. All that is left now are markers commemorating the Battle of Fort Butler. <laughs> Many might think the roots of jazz began with Louis Armstrong, but Louis got his start with a musician named Joe King Oliver. And this king was born just a mile away from Donaldsonville in the community of Aven. We're very, very proud to say that jazz history uh, may have originated right here in Donaldsonville in Aven. Kathy Hambrick is the curator of the River Road African American Museum. Over three centuries of rural African-American history is preserved at their museum in downtown Donaldsonville. Inside, King Oliver shares space with a past Donaldsonville mayor. This man, Pierre Landry, made history in 1868 when he was elected the first African-American mayor in the United States. He was sold as a slave at age, at age 13 for $1,665. Um, he was taught how to read and write on the plantation, and you don't hear very many stories about that because you think that everyone who was enslaved was illiterate and unable to read and write. And he was able to read and write. He was able to get himself to law school. He became a lawyer. He was one of the leading people in the country who was an advocate for educating African Americans after emancipation. and. Um, I'm just very, very proud to say that he was from Donaldsonville. The historic setting of Donaldsonville is also making a name for itself in the movies. Over the years, Louisiana's third oldest city has been the backdrop to several movies, including All the King's Men and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Aspiring actor and Donaldsonville native Richard Zarang has even worked with Tommy Lee Jones as a dialect coach. At any time, did Tommy Lee Jones look at you and say, how do you say that again? <laughs> no, but I could tell he was, uh, a couple of times I would say something, and it was, it was his assistant who was driving, and he was sitting in the, uh, in the front on the driver's side, and I was sitting in the back talking. And a couple of times I would say something, he would just look over at the assistant and <laughs> kind of give a little smile. And, 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 of course, I knew what he was smiling about, but, you know, that's... Uh, uh, so be it, yeah. <laughs> but, but it, was, it was fun. And Richard, just like Kathy and Kirk, all see a promising future for Donaldsonville, a future that holds a firm grasp on the past. And it's been fun showing off LaVille de Donaldsonville to others. And when I saw their interest, it all of a sudden started, you know, getting my interest. And, and then, you know, I, I became more aware of it and, and and kind of, I guess, in some ways, been an ambassador for Donaldsonville uh, with the film industry and all. Not trying to be, but just, I can't help but when they come in to tell them about the city. Oh gosh, uh, probably one of the best kept secrets regarding history in, in Louisiana today. There's no other museum in the entire world that's preserving this history. So with Louisiana being number one in tourism, and I do still believe that we are number one, even considering that Katrina has taken its toll on us, I believe that there needs to be a place where people who come from around the world to learn about the history of African Americans, that there's one place where they can do their research, there's one place where they can see the artifacts and the documents. And of course, doing oral histories up and down the River Road, uh, it seems that all roads led to Donisonville. <laughs> Education is a vital part of the mission and vision of the River Road African American Museum. The museum is open all year round and offers educational programs and tours that highlight the three centuries of history, legacy, and importance of African Americans to the growth of the South. 
For more information, you can go online at AfricanAmericanMuseum.com. And that will do it for this, our fifth edition of Lost Louisiana, What's in a Name? Hey, can you believe it's been 25 towns now? Man, we are just warming up. If you have a suggestion for a Louisiana town with an unusual name, please drop us a line. You can contact us at lpb.org. I hope you've enjoyed this time roaming around the Louisiana countryside. For my photographer, Vernada Woods, I'm Charlie Winnem, and I hope to see you again for another edition of Lost Louisiana. Cause